Troutwine. He's a longtime Erlang developer who knows what it means to build real-time systems. Uh, he loves uh, indulging in uh, punishing feats of self-discipline and asceticism, and that has manifested itself in uh, ultra-long distance running and more recently as uh, powerlifting. That's right. Of course, he's also an avid fan of great architecture, photography, and the space program, which he's going to talk to us about uh, this morning. So everybody give a warm round of applause for Brian. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Yeah, so this talk is also a feat of ascetic discipline. Uh, it took about 200 hours to put together, and I read about eight books, so several thousand pages worth of material, some of which are in incredibly tedious NASA reports. Um, <laughs> so this is a talk about engineering, uh, and it's, it's a talk about achieving big, ambitious engineering projects. Um, I tend to do talks like these where I focus on failure. So my sort of professional instant interest is around systematic failure. So um, what failed, why did it fail, and what can we do about it? So here's the Dust Bowl, man-made disaster. Chernobyl, man-made disaster. Ariane 5, also a man-made disaster. Each one of these have some systematic problem that got expressed. Um, in this talk, I don't want to talk about failure. So I've started to mentor more younger engineers recently, and I'm realizing that the talk about failure is very useful once you have a pattern of how good things look. So this talk is about how a good thing looks. So <laughs> what does it take to do big things? And, and not to belabor the point about failure, but just to, to state it first, the, the big lesson about doing big things is sometimes a thing is not worth doing. So every system has what's called a normal accident or a system accident, and that is a, a failure that is inescapable. It's just part of the thing. And when you go and you want to do something big, you have to identify that thing and say, can I live with this failure? And if the answer is no, then you should not build that thing. Um, so boil water reactors, if you stop cooling them, they pop and then they spread radiation everywhere. So don't build boil water reactors. So, good things. So, in 1962, September of 1962, President John F. Kennedy gives his famous We Choose to Go to the Moon speech at Rice University. In this speech and another speech, speech, he sets a program that is going to send the United States to the moon. So, we will go to the moon, we will land, we will do some science, plant some flags, and then return from the moon safely. So, the first lesson of doing something big, and this is sort of the big thing we'll focus on, is have clear goals. So that's a clear, very distinct ambition that's going to be carried out. Now, when Kennedy gives this speech, you might ask, what did we have available to, to do this goal? And it turns out we had Project Mercury, which the astronauts that flew Project Mercury dismissively called man in a can. Um, so <laughs> Mercury is a research craft. Um, it, it answers the question, can people orbit the Earth? And the answer is yes, um, John Glenn manages to orbit the Earth, but it can't maneuver, so it, it can't change its orbit or anything like that. Uh, really all it can do is sort of point itself backward and then come back down. Um, and it comes back down in kind of a chaotic way, so it just sort of lands vaguely in the Pacific Ocean and then a lot of Navy boats have to rush to pick it up. So the United States realizes that to get to the moon it needs to build Project Apollo. Project Apollo is a great big spacecraft, it's three dudes in a dropship. Uh, one dude stays up in orbit around the moon to catch the dropship if it happens to not make it all the way back up. Two dudes go down and they do a bunch of science. Um, this is a really big, ambitious project. So how does Apollo work? First you get loaded in because when you're in a space suit in a gravity or space suit in a gravity well, you can't move around too well. So you need help just getting loaded in. You do your pre-flight checks, you make your way, oh, oh, you make your way to orbit, and then you leave orbit. Then once you're uh, on the way to the moon, you pop the top, and then you turn around and you grab the lunar module out. Um, the reason they have this arranged is for escape purposes. You then extract the lunar module out of your spacecraft, and then you spend four days in a couple of tin cans on the way to the moon. You get to the moon, you get captured, separate the lunar module, lunar module lands, some people go do some science, then they want to leave the moon, fly back up, and then they get captured by the command module. Now, this is actually pretty tricky because they have to get captured on the first pass around. Um, they don't have a second chance. Then they drop the lunar module because it's no longer useful, go back to Earth, separate the command module, slam down through the atmosphere because that's how we stop, <laughs> launch some parachutes, and then get picked up by some frogmen. So in 1962, 
when Kennedy gives his speech, there have only been two crewed Mercury flights. So it's only been established by the Soviet Union just previously and by John Glenn just slightly after that, that we could even orbit the Earth. We can't do anything else. So how do they achieve this? Well, the, the first thing they do is they get real clear about the things they don't know how to do yet. So I've just walked you through how the Apollo project would have to happen. Uh, and these are all the things that they can't do yet. This is a pretty decent chunk of that list we just went through. So for instance, no one knows if human beings will die if they are in microgravity for too long. Now we know that because we send people up into space for a year at a time, um, but they didn't know that. Uh, no one knows, knew if equipment would work. Incidentally, fun fact, if you stay in space too long, you go blind. Um, no one knows how to do rendezvous and docking. So rendezvous is you just meet two things up in an orbit, you match their orbits. Docking is where you mechanically couple them together. No one really can do EVAs or spacewalks. Um, no one's done it, and certainly no one can do any work, um, work being planting flags and collecting rocks. Um, and ac atmospheric reentry with precision is also not a thing that anyone can do yet. You just sort of vaguely hit an ocean and hope you get picked up one time. So. Bottom, Mercury, this is where things are. Top, Apollo, that's where things need to get. Now, uh, they did a ton of Mercury flights. So they basically took the strategy in Mercury of build the final stage and just keep iterating on it until it works. Basically keep cramming monkeys in it until it's safe to cram a human being in it. Um, that's expensive and it's also dangerous. We killed a lot of monkeys. So <laughs> they, <laughs> we did. Space program is pretty brutal. Um, so they took a middle approach. They introduced a project called Project Gemini. So Gemini is meant to be a bridge between Mercury, what we know how to do, orbit the Earth and get recaptured, uh, and Apollo, which is get to the moon. So Project Gemini is basically a VW Beetle as a spaceship. So it's got two astronauts in it, two seats, and I can't overemphasize how cramped this thing is. You're basically just stuck in your seat for the entire flight, which is gonna be real interesting later. So the white part is the service module. That's sort of where all the fuel uh, tanks live, uh, gas, things like that. The front part houses the reaction control thrusters, things like that. That's how the spacecraft moves around. So Gemini is actually, Gemini is actually able to maneuver in space. So uh, the Mercury project lasts until 1963, and then in April 1964 is the first unmanned Gemini flight. They only do two unmanned Gemini flights. They actually did a whole host of unmanned Mercury ones, but for Gemini, they're pretty confident that they know what they're doing. Um, in 1965, March 23rd, which incidentally, uh, pretty cool, is my birthday. Slightly less cool is also Werner von Braun's birthday. Uh, <laughs> they launched Gemini 3. Now, Gemini 3 is a feasibility flight. It's basically a Mercury-style flight, but with Gemini hardware. Um, so. Left-hand side, 1962, is a Mercury launch done on top of an Atlas, uh, an Atlas ICBM, so its usual payload is a city-ending uh, nuclear weapon. On the right-hand side is the Gemini flight in 1965 on top of a Titan II rocket. Its usual payload, the Titan II, is also a city-ending nuclear weapon, a slightly bigger one. Um, so the lesson here is build on what you have. So <laughs> NASA didn't have to go out and build rockets, it just took city-ending rockets and, and repurposed them by sticking people on top. <laughs> S slightly less explosive payloads. So Gemini 3 actually works out pretty well. Um, it, it only flies for four hours, it's a Mercury-style flight, but it is the first orbital maneuvering by a crewed spacecraft. So Gemini is able to meet its basic goals of actually being able to move itself around in space. Unfortunately, it lands about 84 kilometers off of target, so it still requires a huge pickup group. So, lesson from Gemini 3, start cautious. If you have this big, uh, uh, ambitious engineering project that you're trying to achieve, you're going to have multiple stream, multiple work streams that have to sort of land and converge at the right time. And what you really want to establish is you've got the basics of, of your idea. Is this even feasible? And Gemini 3 demonstrates that sure, it's feasible. So in 1965, June 3rd, just a handful of months later, June 3rd to June 7th, it's a four-day flight, um, uh, Apollo 4, no, sorry, not Apollo 4, Gemini 4 happens. Um, this is the first US multi-day flight. So thankfully people's hearts didn't burst. Uh, the blindness that sets in when you're in microgravity for too long doesn't set in until months later. Um, and it's the first US attempt at an EVA and it's the first rendezvous attempt. So the, the rendezvous attempt unfortunately doesn't go very well. Uh, the idea is to separate from the Titan II stage, which is also in space with the spacecraft, turn around and then come back. But no one's worked out the math for rendezvous at this point. So it turns out that if you actually thrust toward the object that you wanna get to, you change your orbit and so you move away from it. Space is kind of weird like that. Um, 
but the EVA goes pretty okay. So um, the Gemini 2 has two hatches, one for each pilot, and you basically, to get out of the spacecraft, open the hatch and then just stand up. So this is what's called a stand-up EVA. So Ed White is just standing on his seat. Um, the astronauts are strapped with cameras. They're not the best photographers. They tend to overexpose things, but you know, it is what it is. Um, so Ed White is attached by a tether. It's basically anchored inside of the Gemini, so he, he can't float away. And you can kind of see in his hand that he's holding a, a little device. It's actually called a zip gun, because the, the people that are naming things are from the 1950s. It's, <laughs> it's a compressed air gun, so he's able to hold it close to his body and then maneuver himself a little bit. But he mostly spends time bouncing around at the end of his tether. His suit inflates too much, so he can't really move around all that well. Um, and he's pretty exhausted by the, the end of this. So it demonstrates that it's a little possible to do an EVA, but he's not able to do any actual work. The cool thing about their helmets is you can usually see the Gemini in it, and that thing is tiny. Um, fun fact, with this flight, uh, the door mechanism on the hatch was a little dodgy, so when Ed White gets back into the spacecraft, they can't get the door closed for a while. Um, <laughs> this kills the astronauts. <laughs> so. <laughs> Lesson five of Gemini 4, strike while the iron is hot, right? So they have inertia behind this project. Uh, when you have a big project that's going and it's going well, just keep hitting it, hitting it home. Because at some point you'll have a work stream that'll stall out and morale will dip. But while morale is high, while you're able to get results, just go for it. So 1960, uh, August 21, 1965, there is an eight day mission, lasts until the 29th and it simulates an Apollo duration. So this is Gemini 5. Um, and they do, they try and do a couple of cool things. So they try and rendezvous with a radar pod. So this is, um, just lives in the back of the service module and they just drop it out. Um, unfortunately, they also do a new thing where they have extended fuel cells in the Gemini. And there's an issue with the fuel cell where it seems like it's maybe not going to function. So they shut down all the electricity um, for the Gemini spacecraft to see if they have to scrub the mission. Ground control figures out, no, they don't. But by the time they power everything back up on, the, the rendezvous pod has died. Um, so it looks like their rendezvous isn't going to work, but happily there's a bright young spark that's earning his doctorate in rendezvous techniques um, down on the ground by the name of Buzz Aldrin, who figures out that they can rendezvous with a phantom point in space. So they perform a phantom rendezvous. So they actually achieve the first rendezvous, it's just with a coordinate rather than an actual object. So the lesson here is build the tech you need, right? So NASA has reused a ton of stuff. This is basically a, a, a mercury capsule that's slightly enlarged with another seat crammed in it, but they're having to invent new things. Some of those things are temporary. The, the rendezvous pod never gets used again. Um, and some of those things are permanent, like rendezvous techniques. Uh, and that has to be invented by someone that doesn't think he's going to be able to fly in Mercury, so he goes and gets a doctorate. Um, Gemini 7, 1965, you'll notice we've skipped Gemini 6 and we'll get to that. So this is a 14-day flight. So from an eight-day flight to a 14-day flight. It turns out none of the astronauts die during this period, so we're reasonably confident that we can do extended Apollo missions. Um, this flight actually serves as the rendezvous target for Gemini 6, and we'll, we'll get into why that is. And it mostly just sits there. So they evaluate some spacesuits, and they evaluate some foods. Um, so food in space is actually a really hard problem. Um, so they eat a lot of things and let ground control know what it's like to eat them in space. Uh, but they mostly just sit there, so they take a lot of cool pictures. This is the moon rising over the, the, edge, of the, earth, the edge of the Earth. Um, but they're really bored. They actually bring books up because they've got so much spare time. Uh, it's, it's a pretty tedious and painful flight, right? Because they're sitting in a VW Beetle front seat for 14 days. Um, imagine that. So the, the lesson here is endure what must be endured. So <laughs> you'll find in these big engineering projects that there are boring, tedious parts that people tend to not want to do. And I've seen a lot of, of really cool projects stall out on those parts and usually you'll just have someone that'll come through and just power through it. And culturally, go for that. That's, that's what we should be doing. So Gemini 6, 6A in particular, uh, was meant to be the first flight that actually rendezvous and docks with the thing called an Agena target vehicle, which we'll get to shortly. Um, that thing on launch blows up, so they're not able to dock with it because it's dust in the atmosphere. Um, so what they do instead is they rendezvous with the passive Gemini 7. So they actually have a target in space. They're reasonably confident that they're able to rendezvous. And it turns out all the math has been worked out and they're able to maneuver around the Gemini 7, take some cool pictures of it, um, come at it from other angles. So they're really able to hammer home that rendezvous is a thing that humanity can now do. Um, they also play music for the first time in space. Uh, they sing jingle bells, if I remember correctly. <laughs> 
Um, so the lesson from this flight, not all setbacks end in failure. Sure, your target vehicle blew up, but you can still rendezvous with something because there's another mission already in space and they're just sitting there. So Gemini 8, uh, March 16th, 1966, uh, is the actual first rendezvous and docking mission. So they actually do achieve it, but they have a pretty serious accident that happens uh, during the mission. So the way docking in the Gemini project works is they have to do two launches, which is bonkers at this time period. So on the left-hand side, you have the Agena, uh, I believe atop an Atlas, our old friend, um, and, it, and on the right-hand side, you have the, the Gemini. The Agena target vehicle is a um, spacecraft that has a docking ring on one side for the, the Gemini vehicle itself, and on the other end has a rocket engine, and it has a bunch of science experiments along the sides that the astronauts are supposed to EVA and collect. The rocket engine on the end is meant to raise its orbit. So Gemini 8 is able to rendezvous. Rendezvous at this point is pretty boring. Everyone can do it. Uh, they maneuver around. The Agena looks pretty good, so they decide to dock with it. And they successfully dock for the first time in human history. And then the whole thing starts rotating. Um, so at first, they think it's a problem with the Agena, and it's getting faster and faster and faster, so they undock from the Agena, and it turns out it gets faster at that point, because there's actually a sideways or a rotational thruster locked open on the Gemini 8. Um, this is potentially catastrophic because no one thought to spin the Gemini very quickly, so no one knows what its breakup point is. Um, happily, the, the, the pilot, um, who turns out to be Neil Armstrong, knows the Gemini inside and out, so he fires the reaction control system and arrests the rotation. Um, and at this point, by the time he figures it out, it's rotating at almost one RPM, so very fast. Um, when you fire the RCS, that is a mission scrub, so that's why this mission only lasts for 10 hours. But the lesson here is know your systems. Had Armstrong not obsessively studied the Gemini, it's entirely possible that this thing would be spinning debris in space to this day. Um, so when you're doing these big projects, you will have a tendency to want to just deploy stuff that you vaguely kind of understand and then hope that it works. That usually blows up. So any unknown will, will tend to come at, back and bite you. That gets into my system failure talks. Um, so Gemini 9A, three-day flight, it's meant to uh, dock undock, dock, and redock. And it's also meant to perform EVA tests, so working EVAs. Um, unfortunately, the docking doesn't quite work, so their Agena target vehicle also blows up, and then they launch a, a backup, um, but the backup's atmospheric shroud doesn't pop off. So it gets described by Eugene Cernan, who's on this flight, as looking like an angry alligator. Um, <laughs> they actually think about using the Gemini to bump that thing off. Uh, <laughs> they're test pilots, you know. They're, they're <laughs> Uh, mission, mission control says no. They're reasonably certain <laughs> that that will end in, 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 a, in a, a puncture, which would be, that kills the astronauts. Um, so the lesson there is work around some, work around sometimes bust. So while you're trying to get a work stream unplugged, you might attempt to work around and you might get unblocked or you might get blocked a little, for, a little further. Um, I think this thing might still be in space. Uh, I think it's still in space. Gemini 8 is still in space. We can actually still go there today. Um, so, that doesn't work, so they instead focus on the EVA. The EVA actually starts pretty well. Um, Eugene Cernan is able to exit, he does a stand-up EVA, and then he walks around. So his goal is actually to make his way to the back side of the Gemini, uh, unstrap a rocket pack, untether himself, and then fly that rocket pack around. Um, but it's so exhausting for him to get back there that once he finally does get back there and get it all unstrapped, his helmet is totally fogged up and you can hear him audibly panting over the, the radio. So the uh, command pilot Stafford scrubs that idea, mostly because flying an untethered rocket pack around when you can't see is probably a bad idea. Um, so the lesson for this is actually just run your independent projects concurrently. So if you have multiple work streams and they don't have dependencies between one another and you have a project that can sort of prove out two work streams or more at a time, go for it. It really saves a lot of time and it helps build expertise across teams. Um, it turns out we actually do have that rocket pack now. It took until the space shuttle program um, and the arm before we could actually do that successfully. So Gemini 10 is a two day uh, uh, flight and its goal is to dock with a live Agena, be raised by that live Agena into a higher orbit undock and then rendezvous with the dead uh, Agena target vehicle from eight. So its batteries have died, it's totally passive, it doesn't have its radar transponders on. Um, and that totally works. Uh, so they actually are able to dock and undock with their uh, uh, Agena, they get raised up, they then rendezvous, 
with the uh, Agena 8. They perform an EVA from one spacecraft to another, which is the first time. Uh, the astronaut has a little handheld, basically a more advanced version of the zip gun. Um, and it's pretty cool. Uh, once he gets to the Agena, he has to collect a scientific experiment, but EVAs are still really tough at this point. And it turns out there are no hand grips on the Agena, so he has to like grab a bunch of wires and things like that. And he's really exhausted. And I would love to show you pictures of that, but the camera was accidentally left in orbit. Um, <laughs> It turns out we don't know uh, at this time how to properly stow things. So if you look at astronauts now, their suits are just studded with clips, and this is why. Um, so the, at this point, pretty much everything that Project Gemini had to do has been done. So everything has been proven out. So once you have these multiple work streams, you have sort of your basic goals. And, and the idea is each new project to demonstrate what you think you already know how to do, and then start to elaborate on them. Um, and this is how you sort of get into your stretch goals. This is how you find maybe weird edge cases in what you thought you knew how to do. Um, what we can't really do right now very well in the Project Gemini is do working EVAs. So everyone that's done an EVA is exhausted. So the last two flights, and EVAs are a big part of the Apollo project, right? Like that's the whole goal is to get out and do stuff in space. So the last two flights really emphasize EVA work. Um, but at this point, all of this can be done to, to one extent or another. You'll notice there's not really any astronaut walking around doing stuff. Um, so uh, September 12th, 1966, Gemini 11, another two-day flight. Uh, it does a first orbit rendezvous capture of the Agena. So this is important because of the way the command module has to capture the lunar module in the Apollo project. Uh, and then they demonstrate that, they undock, they redock, they rendezvous from different angles. So at this point, they're really just showing off. Um, <laughs> they attempt EVAs. Uh, this is uh, what it looks like when you're in your EVA suit and you're stuck in your VW Beetle seat. It's super cramped. Um, and they do a really interesting thing with this EVA. So it's a working EVA, and their goal is to attach a tether between the Gemini and the Agena and then use a gravity gradient to construct a stabilized system that can spin and generate gravity. This EVA is super exhausting. It only lasts for 30 minutes, but the, the astronaut is so wiped out they cancel all of the other EVA goals. Um, and the tether sort of works, so it turns out the gravity gradient isn't strong enough, so the, the Agena actually bounces around on the end of the tether, or the Gemini, depending on your reference frame, um, and they really only get the tether to kind of work when they uh, intentionally set up a rotation in the whole system by firing with the Agena. So that's why we don't have tethered spaceships. Um, but they do generate a little gravity, around a thousandth of a G. So, the lesson from here is when there's time polish, right? Like if you've, if you've got a deadline that is a couple of months out, there's probably stuff that you maybe would wanna redo, do a little better. Um, now's the time. Like do it while it's fresh in everybody's mind before it becomes a real serious maintenance issue. So uh, 1966, November 1966 is Gemini 12, the last flight. And it does repeat docking uh, rendezvous. At this point, it's really straightforward, everyone knows how to do it. The math has been worked out. On this flight actually is Buzz Aldrin, and they decide to do rendezvous without any instruments. So he actually just works out the math by hand there in the spacecraft, by slide rule, I should say. Um, they perform more EVAs. This flight really focuses on EVAs, and there's actually been a pretty important shift in technique. So Buzz Aldrin, pictured, uh, invents the neutral buoyancy tanks for training. So that's why now when you look at astronauts that are training on Earth, they're in a pool. Um, because it simulates what it's like to be in space. Prior to this point, um, you were basically learning how to EVA while you were EVAing. Um, they also have better hand holds, so now they're designing objects to be gripped in space. So if you see photos of Hubble, which is meant to be serviced, it actually has hand holds and human handprints, which I think is pretty cool. Um, the EVA is, is a working EVA, so it's a little hard to see because uh, space is uh, unpleasant for lighting conditions, but there's, <laughs> like construction work that he has to do. He has to assemble wires. He has to go and collect scientific experiments. So it's really hammering home that it's, not only is it possible to do an EVA and not be exhausted, but you can do really complicated things in space. The Soviet Union, I think, in another six years would demonstrate that you could weld in space, which is pretty cool. Um, and I think the last key takeaway from this mission, so you'll often see this photograph. It's, it's pretty arresting to see a human face in space, but what often gets cut out is this. So he's gone to collect He's not taking a selfie, he's gone to collect a scientific experiment and he's trying to hold it up to a mission camera. Um, and what I wanna call out is that the device is actually covered in instructions because no matter how well trained you are, uh, 
as your context shifts around, you will tend to forget things, or as you bring new people on, you will tend to forget things. So NASA is really obsessive about writing documentation. And that's the next lesson, write the docs. Like when you're attempting these big projects, you have to build a common culture around the, the project. And the best way of doing that is by having a written culture around it. Oral cultures tend to fail once members leave. Um, they do attempt the tether, so he attaches the tether. It works a little better. It's a slightly longer tether, but the gravity gradient doesn't work out so well. Uh, and that's, that's the last Gemini flight. So less than two years from the last Gemini flight, we actually land on the moon. So if you sort of remember, there are tons of Mercury flights, there's a handful of Gemini flights, and then there's a bunch of demonstration um, Apollo flights, smaller each time, and then we're walking around on the moon. And that, that would not have been achievable. You would have seen that big Mercury cluster for Apollo um, if Project Gemini had not been in place to demonstrate all the things that needed to be done. And uh, basically every time you lit the candle on a Saturn V, it was a billion dollars. So it was really worthwhile to build this uh, ICBM-based project. Uh, and this is the whole time period that we've been discussing. It's 57 flights across two years. So if you sort of remember when the, the goal is set, there's only been two people in orbit from the United States. There's only been three people in orbit total. And before the end of the decade, people are walking around on the moon because there's been this very clear goal and a very intentional project to achieve it. And now we actually build giant stuff in space using a lot of these techniques. Um, and it's sort of amazing. It seems like we're not making any progress, but if you sort of look at the, the span of, say, the last 50 years, we've actually come a long way. Like, this thing is a football stadium that we've just assembled in space. Um, so that's my spiel.